So our next talk will be Sean Roberts from University of Texas, Austin. And he will talk about a mixture of organic and inorganic materials. So Sean, take it away. Great, uh, so everybody can see the slides okay and my, I'm coming through okay on sound. Great, okay. Um, so yeah, it's really, uh, I was really happy to get the invitation to speak today uh, from Sugi and from Chris. So I'm hoping that I can continue the, the discussion we've been having. Uh, my group's been working on uh, materials for photon conversion, uh, photon up conversion and down conversion. Let me just get the laser pointer going. There it is. Okay. Um, and mainly we're making hybrid materials like you're seeing here, where we have an uh, inorganic interface. Uh, inorganic has been, uh, nanocrystal in this case has been interfaced with an organic semiconductor. And I'll tell you why we, we, we do that in a second. Uh, but before I get into that, I want to thank the people who in the lab who actually do the work. Um, I'm going to be a little ambitious today and try to talk about briefly three projects, uh, mainly because there's a lot of folks in the audience who have worked in, on these different projects and I want to give them their due. Um, I'm going to start off by talking about a project that's been a collaboration between my group and that of some of Chris's colleagues at Riverside, uh, Mingli Tang and Lorenzo Mangolini, um, and really been pushed by Emily Rowerson, who's actually doing um, kind of, a, uh, kind of a, a visitation in Nate Neal's lab at NREL right now. Um, and then uh, showcase a little bit of work from John Bender and Brittany Pollock. Uh, John just finished his PhD thesis, so he's on the, on the market. Um, uh, but also um, uh, a collaboration between my group and, and Mike Rose, my colleague, and uh, Joel Ease at CU Boulder. Um, and then uh, finish off by showing some work by Inky Lee and Danielle Cadenia, also done by Emily Rowerson as well, too. Uh, Danielle was one of Justin's uh, undergraduates, and Inky is now working with Milan Delore at Columbia, so I want to give them, uh, give them their due. Um, work's been supported mainly by the Keck Foundation and by the NSF. Okay, so uh, we've been working on Singlish Vision for quite some time in my laboratory. Um, I don't think I need to get into the details about Singlish Vision to this audience. Uh, the idea here is that you can excite a uh, excited uh, spin singlet state uh, in a molecule. And if you have a, a kind of a serendipitous uh, alignment of its singlet states to its spin triplet states, where the triplets are about half the energy of the singlet, it's possible if I have a neighboring molecule to share that excitation with it and form a triplet pair out of this that is still net overall spin singlet, but it looks like an individual triplet in each molecule. Um, and this has some, some benefits. You're basically making a multi-exciton state. And so you can do things like, for example, uh, transfer each of these excitations into something like a like silicon solar like a silicon solar cell um, you can get around things like the shock equalizer limit there's some applications for catalysis um, there's some applications for quantum computing due to the spin correlation of these of these um, these excitations um, there's also a really great benefit too if you can go the opposite direction if i can pass triplets from some kind of uh, say infrared absorber or inorganic semiconductor back into molecules uh, there's been a long history of using that to drive triplet fusion, basically single fusion's inverse process to make photon up conversion systems. So if you can do this twice, uh, you can make some really beautiful pictures like this, where you have materials that take in, say, infrared light, but you make it visible. Uh, so this is uh, taking lead selenide nanocrystals and, and pairing them with rubrine. Uh, this is work from Mingli Tang's lab at Riverside. You can do this in the visible, where you're going green to blue, where I'm pairing cadmium selenide. Uh, with um, anthracene in this case to, to get this, uh, this violet emission. And you can do it in the solid state too. And so this is some work that was uh, highlighted by the Center for Exotonics at MIT, um, which um, uh, Mark Baldo and then both Tisdale and a lot of folks in the audience were a part of. So, um, so just showing that you can do this. And I know Mark, Scott, uh, Mark Wilson in the audience has a great effort in this, this area continuing this work. Um, but uh, the question really that, uh, that we've been focusing on uh, in terms of trying to build either a single fission application or a triplet fusion application, it's really this organic inorganic interface. Um, there's a lot of questions that come about from that, how you optimize energy transfer across it, that you build a platform that, that does this. And so we've been really focusing on, on, on that aspect of the problem. Um, and so, uh, you know, this is kind of our, our dream device that we would like to make, uh, taking a single fission material and just schlacking it on top of a silicon solar cell. Silicon accounts for about 95% of the install base for solar energy um, in the commercial sector. And so if you can sensitize silicon using single fission, you can really win out. Um, and uh, the challenge here is, of course, if you want to optimize a device, um, you've got to make a single fission material for one. Um, there's a lot of materials that do this now, so that's usually not, not too bad. Um, but you got to transport the triplets to the interface, you got to get them to go across, and then you got to measure a photocurrent out. So there's a lot of things that can go wrong if you're trying to optimize the structure, right? So you may make a really poor device, but the question is, is what part of the process is really breaking down and, and leading to all this poor performance? So you got to do a lot of controls to figure it out. We really want to look at this interfacial problem because uh, that's been uh, kind of one of the key bottlenecks in this process. And so um, we just decided to strip out everything else and just make the interface. Um, so we've gone towards working with silicon quantum dots now that have been functionalized, chemically functionalized with um, kind of triplet accepting ligands. Um, in this case, we, we don't have enough triplet, enough molecules on the surface actually do single fission. So we're actually going to work at, look at the inverse process, uh, energy transfer from 
uh, a quantum dot into the molecule and see if we can get that to go and try to understand a little bit about how the orientation or the structure of the interface plays a role in driving this process. Presumably, if you can optimize electronic coupling to go this direction, you can optimize it to go the opposite direction as well too, right? Um, what I'm showing here below is the absorption spectra of some of these quantum dots. Uh, these are made through, via a non-thermal plasma synthesis by Lorenzo Mengolini. Mingli Tang does the chemical functionalization to attach these to the surface using a thermal hydrosolation. And then we do a lot of the nonlinear spectroscopy to actually watch energy transfer dynamics in these materials. Um, what I'm showing here below is the absorption spectra. So you see here in black, uh, kind of a, a basically a broad absorption that's coming from just a silicon quantum dot, uh, largely featureless, but imposed upon it are these little humps that are coming from the molecular absorption of anthracene on the surface. Uh, what's interesting, there's a little bit of a redshift uh, of the anthracene absorption features and a little bit of broadening too, which is maybe an indication that you're getting some degree of electronic coupling, right? Um, so we use ultra-fast transient absorption to look at this. Um, I'm showing here the control experiment where we're just photoexciting the silicon quantum dots. Uh, and I should say too, uh, the silicon quantum dot is not bare, like I'm showing here. This is just for simplicity. There's a kind of long, greasy uh, carbon chain, C18 chains uh, that are on the surface uh, to solubilize it. Um, but the, uh, basically, we, we see an induced absorption across most of the visible region that decays away, um, not single exponential, uh, kind of a multi-exponential decay, which a lot of other folks have seen before, um, but on kind of microsecond time scales. Um, you put the anthracene on the surface, and you see something that's really different, right? You see new features here that correspond to some of the molecular states of anthracene. And in particular, this big induced absorption here that pops in uh, on a nanosecond time scale is the triplet state. So uh, you can prove that via sensitization. So you can make a triplet by basically uh, making some other kind of molecule that, that generates its own triplet state uh, pretty readily and then bangs into anthracene and transfers that. And you can measure its triplet absorption that way. Um, and it matches up pretty well with some, some moderate shifts, which um, kind of match the kinds of shifts you see just in the, in the UV-vis spectra of the ground state. Um, what's interesting to us too, was that uh, we see that it's one-to-one -one kinetics. So as a silicon quantum dot decays away, uh, we end up seeing growth of the triplet. Um, so they basically is first order kinetics. Um, and the growth rate is about 22 nanoseconds in this particular uh, measurement. Um, what was interesting to us too, though, uh, maybe a little unfortunate is we were hoping to see full transfer over uh, of the triplet. It doesn't quite do that. You see there's an offset here um, that, uh, that basically forms. And so you don't get kind of quantitative transfer, you get maybe about 50% of the excitations to go just looking at the silicon decay. Um, so we want to understand why that is. And so we built a full photon upconversion system to look at this. So we're having light kind of radiating in, we're transferring triplets to molecules on the surface. These guys don't have enough density on the surface to actually, to actually come together and do upconversion. So we pass those excitations to uh, diphenyl anthracene molecules in solution that then can diffuse together and, and basically undergo upconversion. And so you get this nice, pretty uh, kind of uh, violet emission or blue emission from the, from the diphenyl anthracene. Um, and if you look at just the emission spectra of the quantum dots in the absence of any anthracene at all, you get a broad distribution, right? So these are quantum confined systems. You have a mixture of quantum dots of different sizes. And so you get a broad emission line shape because you have a mixture of large and small quantum dots. Um, and what was interesting when you build a full upconversion system, you get, of course, your upconverted emission here from the nine uh, ethyl, from the, um, from the, uh, uh, from the diphenyl anthracene basically. But then you've also got um, uh, kind of a, a modification of the silicon emission that's happening, right? So you still see silicon emission, which makes sense. We don't get, we don't get full conversion uh, tra transfer into the triplets uh, on the surface, but uh, the, what is being left behind in the silicon is not a uniform distribution. There's actually, you're, you're favoring the larger quantum dots. Um, and so that makes a bit of sense if you put just the triplet energy of anthracene on, this, on there, right? About 1.8 electron volts. And so basically this would suggest that um, we're really depleting the guys that, that have enough energy to actually transfer into anthracene. And so, uh, so actually the, efficient, the transfer efficiency might be a lot better than what we thought. Uh, so we can build a little model that takes all this into account. Instead of having just a, a single quantum dot state, you actually take account for the distribution. And then you can put in kind of a barrierless transfer rate uh, that has no activation and then one that has thermally activated. Um, and uh, you can also account for the Poissonian statistics of binding molecules on the surface. Uh, so we know from the UV vis roughly how many are on the surface. Uh, there's of course error bars associated with this, but um, it does constrain the model. Uh, put in some relaxation rates you can characterize via other control experiments. And really with just two adjustable parameters, you can end up fitting out your, de your data over five decades in time. So it works, works really beautifully. A model comes together pretty simply. Um, and you also get the emission line shift, uh, emission shift bang on right too, even though we didn't fit it explicitly, which was also great to see. Um, so again, we, what we get out from this is that uh, indeed, um, as you kind of surmise just from the silicon quantum dot decay itself, we have about 50% transfer in the sample we're looking at. But what we get out from the model is it tells us that if we can just uh, narrow up this distribution, shrink it up, and uh, just have the barrierless transfer uh, coming from here, we can actually push this to about 
Um, so that's really just the, the ratio of, of the silicon decay right here to the, to the triplet transfer rate there. So that was cool to see, made a prediction. So we want to go off and test it. Uh, can we do it better if we were to narrow up the distribution? So that's hard to do. Uh, what's easier to do synthetically is actually just use a different triplet acceptor on there. So we swapped out anthracene, which has a pretty high triplet energy for perylene, which has a lower one of about 1.5 volts. Um, and so the hope was is that we would improve transfer. Um, so again, we see similar shifts when we put this on the surface. Uh, you know, if we photoexcite it, do we see transfer? And indeed, there's the control. Uh, no, of course, no transfer, no, no perylene. Put the perylene on the surface, and you see those transfer. So there's the triplet of perylene showing up nice and bright. Uh, what was interesting to us, and we still don't fully understand just yet, is there is a really big slowdown in the transfer rate for the perylene system. Um, I have some hypotheses as to why this is, and maybe we can get into, get into that during the Q&A. Um, but we do see there's a, a significant slowdown. So this is happening more on the microsecond time scale as opposed to the nanosecond time scale. Um, but what's also really interesting too is that the triplets once they do transfer, they last for a much longer period of time. Um, we think that partially that, that might be due to improvements in the surface chemistry. Uh, we think these particles are maybe a little less defective than what we were looking on before. We got a little better in our synthesis. Um, but um, with the, that long lifetime also highlighted was kind of an interesting effect, right? I mentioned that we're interested in designing single fission solar cells. And so we wanted to look at transfer of triplets from molecules to silicon, right? And it turns out this data seems like it, that might be going on. And the reason I say that is because if we try to fit their, this particular data set to our original model, right, which looked like this, um, it fits okay, right? You get, to, you get things that are kind of there, it's kind of all right. But if you look at the tail, really, where you're looking at the decay of the silicon, uh, the decay of the uh, perylene triplet, um, you really got something which is overshooting and undershooting in the fit, right? And you can do a lot better if you instead include a back transfer rate that allows for uh, kind of equilibration, excited state equilibration between the, the triplet on the perylene and triplets in the silicon, right? Uh, it gives you kind of a natural fit, gets this kind of non-exponential decay at the tail, more or less bang on right. Um, and really also gives you um, in the model, um, this is, we're actually not, uh, we're not just adding an additional parameter and getting a better fit, right? We actually are, this is a more constrained fit than what I showed before. I had to float some, some aphysical parameters to even get that blue fit to work. Um, so uh, that's pretty neat. What we also get out of this is we end up getting a, kind of a ratio for the forward transfer rate and the back transfer rate. And the back transfer rate ends up being back on this nanosecond time scale, about 20 nanoseconds, whereas the forward transfer is about six microseconds. Okay. Um, so a huge disparity in those two rates, about uh, you know, two orders of magnitude. But I mean, we also think that makes a lot of good sense if you just think about the density of states. If these two things are equilibrated, I've got basically a molecular triplet state, really, you know, so depending on how you want to count your, your spin statistics, one or three states. Um, but if I think about the number of states I can build in silicon near the band edge, just out of, just out of its larger density of states, um, and then I equilibrate those, well, there's a, a density of states component to Fermi's, the Fermi's golden rule transfer rate. Um, I should be favoring back transfer into the silicon much more than, than, than to the into the into the anthracene, just because I have a lot more uh, states in the silicon than I do on, in the paralene. And so we think this this ratio of forward and back transfer rates makes a lot of good sense. Um, that also allows us to make predictions. Uh, as to how far we got to drive the triplet down in energy, if you want to basically, uh, you know, essentially uh, get all the all the population to sit onto the molecule. So if you just turn off the two, the, basically the, the relaxation rates and, and allow for equilibration to occur between the two systems, uh, you would predict that about 41% of the triplets in our current system with perylene would sit on the on the on the molecule. If you drive that triplet energy down to something like tetracine, 1.25 volts. Um, we should get that most of the population should actually sit in the tetracene. So um, if you want to basically pull everything out to the surface, um, you know, the, the triplet energy of the molecules are really good handle for doing that. Um, so, uh, so we think that we can, we can optimize this that way. And so we're actually working on that right now. Um, in terms of going back to the work on, on sensitizing silicon for single fission solar cells, we're also working on that too. Um, so just highlight uh, kind of a quick result with uh, my colleague Mike Rose and his still a student Dylan Moucher. Uh, we ended up making methyl terminated silicon 111. Vapor deposited uh, single fission material microbes worked on for quite some time, perylene diamond molecules um, that uh, undergo single fission in about 250 picoseconds or so. And so what I'm showing here is transient reflectivity spectra of the perylene system. So the time scales I'm showing here are, are on the nanosecond range. So one to say hundred nanoseconds. So we're, what we're really watching is the decay of the perylene triplet, a uh, perylene diamond triplet um, uh, on, the, on the surface. Um, and what we end up seeing is that it decays faster when you put it on silicon than when you put it on quartz. Um, so that's, that was good to see, suggest that you might be getting some degree of, uh, you, well, certainly that you're getting some degree of quenching by the silicon uh, as to what, whether that's actually leading to charge injection, uh, that's uh, something we need to figure out. Um, so, uh, so that's ongoing work. 
Um, but one thing that we've been working on too is trying to control how these molecules pack at the surface um, and, and, uh, and, uh, and how they organize on the surface. And we've been doing that, trying to use some, some, some chemical approaches. And so this is really the, the heart of the project that we've got ongoing with Mike and with a joint student, Brittany Pollock, who's working on this. And so this is a molecule we've uh, basically made, not because it's ideal for doing a triplet injection or anything like that, but more so because we can make it. And it's kind of taught us a little bit of how to do some of the chemical functionalization to chemically tether molecules to silicon. Um, we've got some XPS data showing that uh, we have a fluorine tag here, basically showing that we indeed have some degree of attachment to this on the surface. In full disclosure, the chemistries we're using to do this are not always reproducible, and we're trying to figure that out. Uh, but we have had some samples where it seems like we've got an attachment to go, which has been great. Um, and we're working with Joel Eves now to actually design and figure out how we want to orient the molecules on the surface to get, get good, good injection to go. Um, and you might, might imagine there's two ways you can get injection, which would be just to have good orbital overlap between the pi system and, and the surface below, or potentially by engineering through bond coupling of the pi system into, into the silicon. And the through bond coupling, that's why I say this molecule is not so great for it in this tethering geometry, because this imbid nitrogen actually has a node at the homo and limos and perylene. Uh, but if you could attach me that maybe at the bay or at the head positions on the on the core itself, you might be able to engineer pretty strong through bond coupling. And so we're looking into that right now. Um, okay, so I've got just a few minutes left, and I want to highlight uh, some work from Emily Rowerson, uh, Daniel Cadenia, and Inky Lee uh, on kind of a related system that we're also using to try to figure out how the energetics of the interface plays a role in controlling transfer. So this was the process I kind of illustrated for for you would want to do for something like singlet fission, where you'd make a triplet pair injected into the silicon. Um, and if you think about um, this triplet transfer step into the silicon itself, I, I highlighted before in the anthracene work, it was a single step, right? Which would imply something like a dexter transfer type process, where you have, say, a correlated exchange of electrons between your molecule uh, and silicon, right? Um, now, this isn't the only mechanism that can, that can lead to triplet injection. Um, you could also think about trying to stabilize a true charge transfer intermediate. Right, something like this, where I do say instead of doing a correlated electron exchange, I do a one electron exchange, make an anion, say on my molecule. Uh, basically, I've injected a hole into silicon, and then I transfer the electron over and make my triplet eventually. Right, so you maybe have these charge transfer intermediates that are stabilized, um, and you know, and so basically, uh, you know, what's going to drive that is really going to be the energetics of this charge transfer state versus that of say the triplet state in the materials. Right, um, if the charge transfer state is going to be higher than say the, the triplet state as it approaches the interface. It probably won't be formed. Whereas if it's intermediate, it might form and actually form a form a really important important key intermediate in the in the whole process. Um, for our perylene diamond molecules, we've been focusing on for single fission. We think this energetically shouldn't happen, um, but we do want to know. Um, you know, when we put these molecules on the surface, we have some indications from some other work in our group that uh, how they pack controls their electronic structure, and uh, and that electronic structure uh, can move around quite a bit. And so um, you know these levels that we kind of draw that are based maybe on that kind of a single molecule approach. Uh, might be a really different interface. And so we might need to consider the formation of charge transfer intermediates. So we really wanted to understand um, if we take a, take a, a pairing, inter organic, uh, organic, inorganic pairing, a junction, how much can these levels move around before we have to really start thinking about the formation of charge transfer states, things like that, right? Um, so we took another, uh, another system, uh, lead sulfide quantum dots that have been functionalized with perylene diamond molecules. Um, so this system should actually be tweaked up to do uh, charge transfer as opposed to triplet transfer, just given the, the kind of band alignments we would guess based on the, on the base molecules. Um, uh, but we have a kind of an interesting trick we tried to do to tune the, the lead sulfide states. So there was some work from uh, the Beard group and Enrol showing that if you swapped out molecules that have a uh, large dipole moments and basically functionalize the surface with that, you can, you can change the work function of the, of the P, uh, lead sulfide. So we want to do that as a way to try to tune these levels down and maybe turn off charge transfer and actually allow triplet transfer to start to turn on. Right, so could we actually uh, basically use, uh, you know, uh, uh, move these levels around in a way that, that allows this to happen? Um, and uh, you know, given the range of tuning that was kind of that was suggested by the Beard Group, um, they were able to show that you, they could tune the work function by about two volts in the system with these with these dipoles. So so quite a bit. Um, so we thought maybe we'd be able to actually turn off uh, again charge transfer in the system. Uh, so we tried this out, and so this should be uh, the direction of which we should slow down the charge transfer rate. Um, and indeed, we see that that happens. So this is the anion here of the triplet, or sorry, our anion of the PDI growing in over time. And we see that uh, as we end up uh, putting these different molecules on the surface, we indeed slow it down. But we don't slow it down. We don't turn it off. We just slow it down by about maybe an order of magnitude uh, if you're if you're kind of uh, kind of generous, right? So we modify it, but we don't really 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 shut it down, uh, which has been kind of interesting for us to figure out why that is. 
Um, and uh, so Emily Rowers in our, in our lab did the hard work of figuring out um, kind of the, the base transfer rate by characterizing how many molecules are on the surface. Uh, we can take that into account when we model the data, get out transfer rates really that would correspond to a single molecule uh, adhered to the surface. And again, this is kind of the, the, the result of that is that in this case, we would expect to see charge transfer happen. In this case, we would expect to see triplet transfer happen, but we are still seeing, uh, we're just seeing slower charge transfer happen instead. It should be endothermic in this case for these, for these ones, if we, if we believe the, uh, the beer numbers apply in this case. So we've been looking at this with electronic structure calculations, DFT, uh, with Svetlana Kalina and her student Mohammed uh, at the uh, NDSU. And what's been interesting is that we do see these effects of, of when we put the molecules on the surface in their, in their DFT calculations, these, these uh, different dipole uh, containing ligands, we do see this, this tuning of the, uh, of the basically the conduction band edge in the system, but it tunes by a pretty small amount. It only tunes by about 50 millivolts. Um, so not quite the same, same kinds of shifts that the, that the beard group was saying. Um, we're still not quite sure why that is, um, but uh, we're trying to figure that out. But what's interesting is that what we do see and what we think is responsible for the change in our rates is that as you basically increase uh, the dipole moment of these ligands, uh, you end up getting a, a basically directional interactions between the, uh, the ligands themselves and the PDIs on the surface. Um, so PDI has got this kind of quadrupole moment on the backbone. There's a lot of uh, kind of electrostatic uh, displacement of charge on it, and it can actually attract itself to some of the different ligands that are on the surface that can lead to some different geometries, uh, different average geometries that you get when you optimize these calculations where you see a closer approach of the PDI to, to the quantum dot. So it kind of bends over a little bit. Um, and so we think that that might be responsible for what's going on. And if you just do kind of the, the, the cheap back of the envelope calculation and look at these distances, it does follow an exponential distance dependence in terms of matching up with the rates that we end up getting experimentally with a kind of a beta coefficient for, uh, for just kind of through space charge transfer that's kind of in line with what people have seen for um, kind, of char you know, kind of charge transfer between quantum dots and molecules. So, uh, so we think we're getting a structural change here. Um, and that might also indicate that controlling the structure, of course, when we try to do this with silicon, it's gonna be really important. Okay. So with that, I'll just, uh, I know I'm out of time, so I'll go ahead and, uh, and wrap. Um, but the point here is that we, you know, this uh, goal of getting a uh, triple transfer from molecules to silicon, we think we can see it both forwards and back. Um, so I think that's pretty key. Um, and, you know, really the key here is controlling the interface in some way. And we really just have some real crude proof of principle experiments showing this can work. We're really not trying to trace out all the details in, in understanding how the structure of the interface actually plays a role in that whole process. So with that, I'll stop and say thank you. See, thanks. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, we are going to go right into the questions, I think. And the first one is from Justin Karam. Can you fit the transfer rate from the triplet to a model where there's an activation barrier? Um, is, is there a barrier, basically? Yeah, so uh, you, you can. Um, we, I found that it, so we tried, we tried doing things like Marcus uh, uh, theory type transfer rates, right? Where you include things like, um, where you include a, a kind of a solvate, uh, uh, we call it a reorganization energy, those kinds of things. Um, uh, and and it, it fits the data well enough, um, but not so much so that um, that it gives a, a better fit than what we're just getting with the simple Arrhenius model. Um, so um, it might just be that the data is not as sensitive to it, um, that kind of a thing. But um, I, I, I've kind of demurred away from, from using this type of, that type of model just on the basis of our data right now, just because um, it's adding additional fit parameters. And so it might be giving a number of parameter price fit. Um, but uh, it's not, not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to rule those things out to say that there's not an activation barrier for transfer, but it's something we're trying to, um, trying to understand some additional, additional modeling uh, computationally. Okay, so using Occam's razor, it sounds like. Uh, from from Doran Bennett, uh, what is the why is the ratio of forward to back electron trend or rates of the triplet state, why are they so different for the different molecules if it's controlled by density of states? Yeah, that's a great question. So I, sh I showed this to, uh, to Joel Leaves and what Joel kind of suggested is that there might be, you know, that if you're changing the coupling between the two different systems, right? Um, if the coupling controls both the forward transfer and the back transfer, right? The same kinds of overlaps, then it might be a kind of a universal scaling. Um, so he's actually suggested trying to just scale the time axis and see if that overlays the two data sets. We haven't done that yet. Um, but the one thing that, the one complication in doing all of that, it, it, as well as that the, uh, the, the, the thing I didn't tell you is that those two, those two sets of quantum dots are, and, well, the two sets of uh, ligands on the surface are, are put on the surface by two different chemistries. Okay. So the surface chemistry itself might be a little bit different. Um, so in the case for the anthracene, where we're doing a thermal hydrosylation, um, that doesn't work for the perylene. You, you end up polymerizing the perylene and get a whole bunch of gunk that doesn't work. So we are using a kind of a, a, um, a catalyst driven process to put that on the surface. Um, and we think that that might lead to slightly different surface chemistries. Um, 
in part because if you look at just um, the base silicon quantum dots themselves that are that are created without the, the triple accepting ligands on, on their own, they have very different lifetimes. Um, so we see different degrees of trapping and things like that. And we think that I think that the anthracene ones are the, 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 that batch of dots used for that those experiments were more, more prone to uh, just deactivation. So um, so that's something that we're looking into. Okay, another question from Suggy. Have you tried determining the distance dependence of the triplet energy transfer as opposed to the charge transfer? Yeah, so we have another project that's working on that right now. Um, we're, we've, been to, we've been trying to tune that up, uh, uh, basically um, uh, using a kind of a set of parallel ligands that have different uh, different lengths uh, uh, for the linker, those kinds of and different stiffnesses as well. Um, Ming Li is also working on this too, uh, so she's been trying to put in uh, kind of different different linkers as well on the surface. Uh, so that's those are ongoing experiments. Um, we have some interesting data that kind of I would well maybe it's a little too early to say this, but but I think that some of these ideas that we're seeing for the um, for the lead sulfide PDI system, where the bending of the ligand over, moving that orienting that towards the surface, I think that plays a much larger role than than may have been recognized or kind of assumed in some prior work. So. Um, we're trying to trying to model that as well using some MD simulation control. Okay, we'll look forward to that. From Milan Delore, uh, thank you, Sean. What is the nature of the exciton in the silicon quantum dot before it transfers to the molecule? In other words, is it already a triplet? Does it have a well-defined spin state? Uh, I would say it doesn't. Uh, so the way that I think about the the, the triplet in the silicon is that it's, it is uh, uh, that that it. Uh, spin orbit coupling is is large enough that you're going to get mixing of the different spin states. Um, so so really thinking about that that I, I think of it as something that's fluid. Um, so it can um, it can it can oscillate between um, kind of spin triplet states and, and spin singlet states and, and other kinds of uh, kinds of uh, multiplicity states in, in the in the silicon. Um, there's been work showing that you can you can sensitize you know singlet absorption uh, in silicon quantum dots. You can um, you can, uh, we can, we've shown that you can do now triplet transfer from these things. So I, th I think of this as pretty fluid. Um, uh, I don't know how strong the spin order coupling is relative to other materials, but um, that seems to be the picture that's kind of emerging from this, this nanocrystal molecule community. Okay, so you think spin, spin dynamics are probably secondary. Um, a question from Will Tisdale, uh, what, are the, what are those uh, PBS energy levels referenced in the DFT calculations? Um, you know, is it a fair comparison between those and the photoelectron experiments? Yeah, that's a really fair point. Uh, so the PBS that we're using right now, they're, they're much smaller particles than we look at experimentally and that, that Matt looked at um, in his paper as well too. So that's the one thing that gives, that gives me a little bit of pause. Um, if anything though, I would think that, um, that that would make these things uh, more prone to what's going on, that their, their energy levels should shift more based on what's on the surface. Um, but to also to be fair, we're not putting as many ligands on the surface as we probably have in the experiment. Right, um, so it's probably an additive effect, and maybe we're just not loading up the servers with enough ligand to really see those kinds of shifts. Um, but you know, it seems like we're, um, if anything, the, what, what I would say is what we're getting out is that um, when you do look at how the PDI levels are also being affected, I didn't highlight that, but they also shift a little bit too when you put these ligands on the surface. Um, that you end up seeing kind of an anti-correlated uh, behavior. You would think that the that the PDI limo and the conduction band edge gap would correlate with rate and it correlates in the opposite way than we would expect experimentally. So that's why I'm saying, that's why I'm highlighting this geometric shift as what's going on. So since that seems to match up with what we're seeing experimentally, I'm gonna get this exponential dependence on the distance that seems like it matches up with the people seeing for beta coefficients. But again, um, you know, with the, with the quality of the DFT, with the sizes of things that we can simulate, um, it's, it's, a, it's still a bit of a question, very performant. 